How do you mean no more commission? Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama, you know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can okay it unless it goes through London. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish. Um, what's happening today? Hello and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. It is now and forever will be known as the rape cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe. 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was a balance for. and I think we made it by 53% if I remember correctly for going in and ever since that time England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European and that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. About the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets. percent of HIV positive people in Scotland know their status. 98% of this, 91% are receiving treatment. 97% of those on treatment are achieving viral suppression. So while we have achieved the UN AIDS 1990-90 targets, um, there remains a clear priority to increase the number of people who know their status and then can go on to get that treatment and move towards um, virus suppression. David Torrance. Thank you for that answer. Kirkcaldy lost a popular member of its Pride community to AIDS earlier this month. Ross Scott tragically passed away at the age of just 25, having lived with HIV virus for two years without knowing. Usually antiretroviral drugs allow people with HIV to live long lives, but unfortunately Ross' diagnosis was too late for treatment to be effective. Does the Minister agree with me that we all have a role to play in increasing awareness of HIV and the importance of prompt testing and treatment? Minister. I, I do agree. It is, is absolutely crucial that we remain vigilant in this area and that we work collaboratively in order to keep making the progress. Um, a clear priority, as I said, is to increase the number of people who know their status so they can go on to get that treatment. That's why the Scottish Government has set up a short life working group to consider options for improving HIV testing and we continue to work closely with NHS boards and third sector organisations to raise awareness and to eradicate the stigma around the virus and tackle the false myths and prejudice that still surround it. I, I think stigma remains one of the biggest barriers to people getting that HIV test, which will ultimately save lives. And Neil Finlay. Um, the HIV outbreak among the homeless community was exacerbated by previous cuts to drug and alcohol budgets. Will the Minister confirm that he has made representations to the Finance Secretary in the run-up to the budget to ensure that we put the right money and resources behind dealing with uh, Scotland's uh, drugs crisis. Minister. The HIV outbreak in, in Glasgow is um, obviously of huge concern. Um, the member is correct that um, largely that is between a, a, a community which um, crosses the boundaries in terms of a, a group of the most vulnerable homeless and, and um, 
people who uh, use various inject substances. Um, it's absolutely crucial that we take actions to support Glasgow and, and the health board um, there to respond to the out, outbreak. There's been a number of meetings with services in that area, um, bringing um, services together. One of the um, really useful projects which is doing work along with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is uh, Waverley Care, um, who are, um, have a number of projects engaging directly with the most vulnerable uh, populations. Within that, that scheme, we currently provide third sector funding of £2.13 million for projects to support people with bloodborne viruses. Thank you. Question number two, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has fully costed the policy commitments it has made that are to be delivered through local government. Cabinet Secretary, uh, all new I... policy commitments that have a financial cost for local government are indeed costed and discussed with local government, which includes an agreed approach on distribution matters. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Uh, I met with local government colleagues this week and a key concern they raised was the issue of adequate funding for the rollout of additional childcare. They were not against the Scottish Government's principle, but they were very worried about the challenges of rolling out the policy across different challenges in Scotland. Is the Minister aware of these concerns and will he act on them? I will continue after discussions with COSLA about the budget and other matters. I will also have discussions with opposition political parties about the budgets. So those discussions have begun. I look forward to uh, those uh, uh, discussions ongoing in a very constructive fashion. Uh, the policy in early learning and childcare is fully funded. That uh, funding agreement was reached with local government where we also covered distribution matters as well. If there are any further concerns, I am happy to engage with COSLA to progress those uh, talks. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given it's so interested in full costings, can the Minister advise as to whether the Labour Group has provided details of how it will cost its own proposals for local government, or said how these will be funded either by tax rises or switching funds from other budget portfolios, or by demanding additional powers for local government, which, like workplace parking, they will then no doubt vote against? Cabinet I know there was a debate uh, yesterday. Uh, I will set out an SNP budget to the Scottish Parliament. It will be for other parties to engage with me constructively. But no, I haven't had any detailed alternative costings, and I look forward to such costings coming forward if opposition parties disagree with the proposition that I present to Parliament. Murder Fraser. Presiding officer, given that the Fraser of Allen Institute have said that the Westminster Block grant to Scotland will increase by 2% in real terms in the coming year, would the Finance Secretary agree? that there is no justification, therefore, for any further cuts to local council funding. It has been the Conservative uh, government, of course, that's cut our uh, budget and, and in real terms. So I think that's a very interesting proposition from Murdo Fraser. Uh, I would also point out that we are abiding by our commitment around real terms, uh, passing on the Barnet consequentials to health as well. And of course, we haven't cut local government's budgets. So over the time I've been Finance Secretary, local government has enjoyed real terms increases in their resources, uh, despite the position of the Conservatives, which was to call for tax cuts for the richest society and oppose those budgets that gave more resources to local government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question number three, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. All the provisions in the Act have been implemented except the parts that provide for the creation of sexual harm prevention orders and sexual risk orders. Until the UK Government amends the necessary reserved primary legislation, these orders will not be enforceable across the rest of the UK. It would therefore be inappropriate and irresponsible to enact upon them. Uh, my predecessor and I have raised this with UK ministers on a number of occasions. Uh, to date, the UK government have not identified a suitable legislative vehicle to make these changes. We will commence these orders as soon as the UK government passes the appropriate legislation. Until that time, the existing prevent preventative orders for sexual offending in Scotland and the multi-agency public protection arrangements provide the most robust and enforceable regime for keeping the public safe. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Citizens Advice Scotland has reported a 50% increase in traffic to their web pages, which offer advice for people who have been affected by the sharing of intimate images or videos without their consent. And that disappointing news that you've just told us there, can you tell us, uh, with, without the, government, the UK government enforcing this, uh, these, making these changes, what impact is this delay going to have on those victims? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, I thought those figures quoted by James Dornan are, are very stark. And, look, the UK government have indicated that they, they do see the, uh, uh, they, they understand the intent behind what we're trying to do. They think that there's uh, certainly some wisdom in doing what we're doing, but uh, they have not made any commitments around when they'll bring forward that the changes to the reserve legislation, uh, despite, as I say, both me and my predecessor asking for that. There's no time scale in place. Um, as I say, there are um, orders at the moment that we can use that will, of course, uh, keep people safe, but we want a stronger regime, uh, and we believe that, that can be done uh, with the orders that would require UK government legislative change. So in the meantime, uh, we'll continue to press the UK government to pass the necessary primary legislation uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Question number four, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to allow NHS Dumfries and Galloway to change existing cancer pathways by aligning with the West of Scotland cancer network rather than the South East Scotland network in order to reduce journey times for treatment for cancer patients in Wigtonshire. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. <clears throat> the Scottish Government is aware that Dumfries and Galloway has publicly stated its intention to seek alignment with the West of Scotland Cancer Network at some point in the future. While no formal planning discussions on any realignment have taken place, my officials have been engaging with NHS Dumfries and Galloway on this matter. Such a significant change would require considerable discussion and planning with other neighbouring boards and any service change would have to undergo consultation to provide safety and quality assurances and ensure that patients' waiting times were not negatively impacted. Colin Smith. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he accept though it will take direct action from the government either to increase capacity at the Glasgow Cancer Centre or, or to enable another health board effectively to swap with Dumfries and Galloway in order to allow them to realign with the West of Scotland. And given the time it would take for that to happen, does she support an interim measure of allowing patients in the west of the region in Wigtonshire to realign earlier or to promote the fact that actually they already have a freedom of choice to choose to go to Glasgow instead of that long journey to Edinburgh? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, grateful to Mr Smythe for his, for his uh, question. Of course, partly what he touches on uh, at the start of that supplementary question is why it does take some time in terms of planning and discussions uh, between Dumfries and Galloway and other boards in order, if a realignment is sought, that some of those matters are addressed. And they are addressed, uh, to my assurance, in terms of quality, safety uh, and uh, waiting times for patients. He's also, of course, quite right uh, that patients can make requests for alternative treatment locations from the current primary pathway at the moment and do do that. Uh, my understanding is that Dumfries and Galloway is very responsive to those patient requests. Um, I am very happy to ensure that that is more widely understood, but of course the member himself, uh, as an MSP in that area, uh, can contribute significantly to ensuring that constituents understand that that choice is currently available whilst other matters are being looked at. Question number five, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is working with drug companies and pharmacies to reduce single-use plastics in the dispensing of medicines. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Sorry, Presiding Officer. The licensing and safety of medicines is a reserved matter for the UK Government. In addition, regulations which cover medicines packaging are set out in European and UK law, provided the packaging type used ensures the ongoing safety and quality of the medicine the UK Medicines Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency cannot refuse to authorise the packaging. Maureen Watt. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but does she agree with me that in relation to asthma inhalers, for example, that this could move at a much faster pace than at present and only the canisters need to be dispensed and the holders can be used several times, reused several times? Mr. Secretary. I do agree that there is a general question that needs to be addressed, uh, uh, perhaps at a greater pace than at present. Uh, on the specific issue of inhaler devices, they are obviously a precision piece of equipment which will work with canisters from the same manufacturer only. The plastic container needs to be robust enough for several cycles, and we would encourage manufacturers to work with Medicines and Healthcare Products Retail Authority on the licensing of products that would allow the product to be reused. There's a recycling scheme in place for respiratory inhalers. The scheme called Complete the Cycle has been introduced by GlaxoSmithKline and inhalers can be recycled at participating pharmacies. Thank you. Question number six, Alexander Burnett. 
presiding officer and can I note members to my register of interest on forestry uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its forestry planting targets. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. The Scottish, Scottish forestry provides regular updates on the progress towards the government planting targets. These are publicly available on Scottish Forestry's website. The latest figures, presiding officer, show that so far 10,954 hectares of grant-funded uh, planting has been approved for planting in 2019. In addition to that, Forest and Land Scotland are expecting to plant 400 hectares in 2019. The final figures will be published in June this year. Thunder Burnett. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Now, recent inquiries and purchase requests to tree nurseries by people wishing to carry out planting have been knocked back, citing a shortage of supply, and many are now having to delay their planting plans till 2021. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of this issue, and what is he doing to ensure that it does not impact on Scotland's planting targets? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've been aware of this issue for the last uh, two or three years. Uh, in fact, in 2017, we started to take action in order to address this. The situation has been exacerbated by summer drought conditions in 2018, leading to reduced supplies of seedlings from nurseries affected by that drought, coinciding with the big increases in planting in uh, Scotland. We anticipated uh, this issue some years ago, and we have therefore supported uh, 20 applications which have brought forward over £2 million worth of investment projects by nursery businesses. This has resulted roughly in a 25% increase in the production capacity of three nurseries in Scotland. In addition to that, FLS are developing plans for expanding their in-house nursery capacity. In addition to that, the private sector are being encouraged to consider new investments in tree nurseries. Planning officer, Scotland is leading the way in forestry. Last year, we planted 84% of all the new plantations in Britain. We, could, we intend to continue to give that lead uh, to address the economy, but also climate change. And I hope our friends down south uh, are taking notice. Question number seven, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to a letter from 27 business groups to MSPs regarding concerns at the, a proposed amendment to the Non-Domestic Rate Scotland Bill, which would remove ministers' ability to set business rate poundage and automatically end the Small Business Bonus Scheme and other benefits. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Oh, that assessment is correct. On the 15th of January, the Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy, Kate Forbes, responded to that letter confirming the Scottish Government's unequivocal support for the uniform business rate and our concern of the complexity, risks and unpredictability related to this stage two amendment to the bill, eh, which was supported by the Green, Conservative and Labour parties. The Scottish Government will continue to work with members of all parties to deliver a bill which supports growth, improves administration and increases fairness. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, has the Cabinet Secretary made sure that the members on opposition benches understand fully the implications of withdrawing powers from uh, his office and from the government generally, particularly in relation to the small business bonus scheme, which has protected high streets across Scotland, which has protected small businesses in my constituency in the North East and across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I would like to think that all members are aware of legislation that they're voting for when they're voting for it, and I suppose I am therefore surprised by some members' position on this matter. For example, the Conservatives, as of yesterday, Jackson Carlaw's their leadership bit, has given us the third current running Tory position on the non-domestic rates bill as it stands, but the reality is, if the amendment has moved uh, by Andy Whiteman, it is it continued uh, through to stage three, it would remove the government's ability to set that uh, national unitary poundage and also scrap the release that this government has supported, such as the small business bonus. But actually, unfortunately, Andy Whiteman has managed to find a way to be both anti-business and anti-environment because there are environmental reliefs that would also be scrapped as a matter of law and ones that we're about to try and deliver, such as for the deposit return scheme, which I thought 
uh, those supporting the environment would support as well. So other reliefs as well as the small business bonus that would be scrapped would include the renewable energy relief, district heating relief, and as I say, the reverse vending machines to, to support the environment and to support business, I would encourage opposition members to listen to the wise words of Kate Forbes, do the right thing, <laughs> understand the law, understand what you're voting for, and just as we want a unitary poundage, maybe the party should have a unitary position which would be more supportive of the uh, outcomes that we're all trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. Question number eight, Michelle Valentine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the issuing of licences for the shooting to scare and shooting of pestiferous birds. Minister Marie Goujon. Scottish Natural Heritage is responsible for determining licence applications under the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. Licensing for the shooting to scare and shooting of pestiferous birds can be granted by SNH in order to prevent serious damage at fisheries or inland waters. Applications to solve specific problems are looked at on a case-by-case -case basis and will only be considered if the applicant can demonstrate that they have explored all other non-lethal anti-predation measures and find them to be either ineffective or impracticable. Michelle Ballantyne. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, as the Minister is probably aware, the challenge for local fisheries and river management boards is that applications for these licences require organised systematic counts of the number of birds on the river. Many of these fishery boards are now drastically underfunded and often rely on volunteers, which stifles the ability of the boards to conduct the required um, counts. So I would ask the Minister if the Scottish Government will work with Scottish National Heritage to support the smaller fisheries and river management boards by developing limited licences that are less resource intensive to obtain. Minister. I, I, I would be happy to discuss that matter further with the member. I know that this is an issue that she takes a keen interest in, having sponsored an event a, a couple of weeks ago where uh, the discussion took place around what we're doing to conserve uh, wild salmon because that is vitally important and it is uh, absolutely a priority for this government. Now, I know that when it came to licences in general, uh, I think there had been discussion around whether that could be included as part of general licences and SNH had undertaken a review of that and decided not to uh, include that as part of a general licence. But again, I'd be happy to consider these, these items further and correspond with the member on these matters. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. Now, before we turn to First Minister's questions, I'm sure members would like to join me in welcoming to our gallery Monsieur Francois Paradis, the President of the National Assembly of Quebec. Now we turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlo. Presiding officer, may I begin today by noting that the Prince of Wales is today joining world leaders gathering in Israel to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, survivors of which continue to live happily among us today in Scotland. We, of course, will be marking the occasion with a debate next week, but Scotland will remember and always stand in memory of those who perished in order that we can prevent any such horror ever happening again. <laughs> uh, presiding officer, water pouring in through ceilings and windows, mushrooms growing in the carpets, and rats scurrying about the mouldy floors. What word, would the first min what word would the First Minister use to describe the state of some of Scotland's police stations? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I take the opportunity to associate myself with uh, the remarks of Jackson Carlow about the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, uh, that anniversary, I think, is very much in the thoughts of all of us at this time. Uh, the horror of what was experienced there is beyond our imaginations, and we must all be determined, as we prepare to mark the anniversary in our own ways here in Scotland next week, we must all be determined to play our parts in ensuring that a horror of that nature and on that scale can never be allowed to happen again. Um, on the issue of uh, policing, presiding officer, um, I would say that I do think uh, Jackson Carlow has something of a nerve uh, to raise issues like this. Because before I, before I address the issue 
directly. Let me just remind Jackson Carlow and the Chamber that it was indeed the Conservative Party that reduced uh, the resource budget of this government by £1.5 billion, that's 5% in real terms since 2010. It's also the Conservatives who have uh, robbed the Scottish Police Service of £125 million in VAT that should never have been claimed. But despite, despite all of that, since 2016, the annual budget for policing in Scotland has increased by more than £80 million, bringing it to £1.2 billion in this year. The capital budget of the service has increased in this year alone by 52% uh, to support the rollout of mobile technology. Uh, so we are investing in police officers, also of course maintaining a thousand more police officers in our communities uh, while the Tories have cut 20,000 from the streets uh, in England. So we'll take no lectures from the Conservatives on matters of public services. And as we prepare our budget for the year ahead, presiding officer, our priority will continue to be investment in public services and we'll leave Jackson Carlaw to argue for tax cuts for the highest paid in our country. Jackson Carlaw. Well, the cliché meter was ringing loud there, was it not? <laughs> But I noticed in that long uh, peroration, the one word the First Minister didn't use was hyperbole. But that's exactly how her Justice Secretary reacted when he was confronted with these pretty shocking images of working conditions in some of Scotland's police stations. It's no wonder that the head of the Scottish Police Federation is furious at Mr Yusuf's denial. Warnings from frontline police officers about the conditions in which they are being forced to work have been made year after year, but little or nothing is done. Who is right, the Scottish Police Federation or Mr Yusuf? First Minister. Interesting that what Jackson Carlaw refers to as cliché is actually investment by this government in our vital public services. So let me just repeat again the commitment of this government to our hard-working police officers who, yes, work under pressure like all of our public sector workers do. That pressure having been exacerbated over the past 10 years by austerity imposed on this government by Conservatives at Westminster. This government, in contrast uh, to what we see south of the border, is protecting Police Scotland's revenue budget during this Parliament. Uh, that includes in this year alone a £42.3 million increase in funding. Police Scotland's total capital expenditure is the fourth highest of all UK police forces. Uh, there has been a £12 million increase in this financial year alone. Uh, we're also providing reform funding to the SPA and of course we are maintaining uh, police numbers significantly above the level inherited in 2007. Uh, and uh, into the bargain, uh, we gave our police officers a higher pay rise than they got in any other part of the UK. So I know the pressure police officers work under. I'm grateful for the job they do each and every day. We will continue in our budget decisions to prioritise our public service workers and I think the Tories uh, should actually be ashamed at their own record in Westminster in this regard. Jackson Carlow. These long perorations from civil service prepared briefs really don't cut it, First Minister. This isn't just about unpleasant, uncomfortable and potentially unsanitary situations in which police officers and staff are expected to work. There are major safety concerns too. Even as Mr Yusuf was dismissing concerns as hyperbole, the ceiling was falling down at the police station in Broughty Ferry, not just literally but also metaphorically on Mr Yusuf's denial. Under the SNP, out of 45 UK police forces, Police Scotland is the fifth worst funded. However, yesterday, yesterday the UK government announced over a billion pounds extra for policing, with the Scottish government receiving some 100 million. Will the First Minister assure our hard-working police officers that this additional funding will be used to protect police officer numbers and at the very least improve the environment in which they are expected to work? First Minister. While, while the Conservatives have been cutting the budget of this government, we've been protecting the budget of Absolutely. Scotland's police service. And, of course, uh, because of the incompetence of the UK government, we will require to set 
our budget for uh, the next financial year before we've seen the colour of the money that Jackson Carlaw keeps saying is coming our way. So I certainly hope uh, those promises uh, turn out to be accurate. We will continue to do everything we can uh, within our powers and our resources to protect our police service the length and breadth of the country. As I said a moment ago, total uh, capital expenditure in Police Scotland is the fourth highest of all UK police forces. Uh, we've increased capital budgets in this year by 50 we're protecting the revenue budget, we're protecting police numbers and we're making sure that our police officers uh, get the rise in pay that they deserve, that police officers elsewhere in the UK are not getting. So we will continue uh, to support our police officers as they continue to support the people of Scotland in the excellent work that they do each and every day. Jackson Carlaw. First Minister, the budget this SNP government receives from Westminster is on the rise. And what do we have to show for it? Leaking police stations and collapsing ceilings, half-built ferries, boarded up hospitals and closed off children's wards, a crisis in Scotland's schools. Years of missed opportunity from a distracted and disengaged government. Because next week we are promised yet more updates on her favourite topic. First Minister, what chance is there of updating us instead on when your government is going to start sorting out the things that really matter, which are failing under this SNP administration? First Minister. Well, let me just update uh, Jackson Carlaw again on the reality uh, in Scotland, as opposed uh, to what he wants people to think. £1.5 billion in real terms removed from this government's budget by the Conservatives over the past 10 years. Uh, but in spite of that, we've continued to invest in our NHS, taking it to record levels of funding. We've continued to invest in our police service. We've continued to support our public service workers working so hard across the country. Uh, but let me uh, just draw to Jackson Carlaw's attention what the Fraser of Allender Institute has to say about his proposals that he's put forward just in the last couple of weeks. The Freder of Allender Institute makes clear, I'm about, oh, I'm about to read it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm quoting here directly, uh, Jackson Carlaw's proposals would, and I quote, reduce the government's income tax revenues by around 270 million pounds. He, he wants me to go on. So I will go on. Uh, in addition to that, they say that this isn't about middle earners. They say, and again, I'm quoting, a policy framed as supporting middle earners predominantly benefits households at the top of the distribution of household income. So there we have it, presiding officer. £270 million out of our public services and handy to the richest in our society. That's what Jackson Carlaw would deliver. I'll continue to deliver investment in our public services. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, can I uh, associate the Scottish Labour Party with the remarks about the importance of commemorating the liberation of Auschwitz uh, and uh, ensuring that we all accept that it is all of our duty never to forget the Holocaust, not just for this generation, but for future generations to come? Presiding officer, the SNP came into office promising students that they would dump the debt monster. But they didn't dump the debt, they dumped the promise. This week, Audit Scotland revealed the consequences of that dump promise. Student debt now soaring to £5.5 billion, more than double the level it was in 2011. And this is not simply down to an expansion of student numbers, because what the report also showed is that average student debt per head has more than doubled as well. And we know that it is the poorest students from the poorest communities who are forced to borrow the most. First Minister, will you simply admit that the SNP misled students and will you apologise to them? First Minister. Well, what I will do is point out that because of the policies of this SNP government, not least 
keeping access to university free of tuition fees, Scotland has the lowest level of student debt anywhere in the UK. So let's look in particular uh, at the figures. Uh, the stats that Richard Leonard cites, yes, show that average student loan debt in Scotland is £13,800. But that compares to a figure in England of £35,950. A figure in Northern Ireland of £23,550. And that figure in SNP-governed Scotland of £13,800 compares to a figure in Labour-run Wales of £22,920. So I think the ones who should be apologising are perhaps the Labour Party for the record in Wales. Richard Leonard. Well, some students in Scotland have debts of £27,000. And First Minister, you know, you know in your heart of hearts that you are failing to support our students properly. That's why three years ago you set up an independent review of student support. Two years ago it reported. The Minister accepted its recommendations. Parliament supported its core recommendation of a guaranteed minimum student income based on the living wage. But two years on and nothing has happened. You are letting students down. How many generations of Scottish students have to go through university before this government keeps any promise on support for student living? First Minister. Okay, I, I hope Richard Leonard is going to listen carefully to the detail of this answer. But before I get on to the detail, I've already uh, told him that Scotland is the lowest level of student debt in the UK. Uh, but in addition to that, we've also seen the smallest increase uh, in student debt of any of the countries of the UK. £7,800 in Scotland, £9,840 of an increase where Labour are in government in Wales. Uh, Richard Leonard says that total debt uh, has increased uh, in Scotland. It has, but in the rest of the UK it has trebled. Uh, so those are the facts. But let's come on to uh, support for poorer students. Full-time students from the poorest areas uh, receive more support than from the richest areas. 67% uh, of students from the 20% most deprived areas got a bursary compared to 22% in the richest areas. But the part I want to come on to in detail is what Richard Leonard said about action after the student support review. He said, and I think I'm quoting him directly here, nothing has happened. So this is the detail I would like him to pay close attention to, because since that uh, review was published, we have firstly uh, begun to implement its income guarantee by increasing the bursary for care experienced students to £8,100 a year. Uh, following the recommendations, we've raised the higher education bursary threshold. Uh, we've increased bursary support for the poorest uh, young students. We've increased bursary support for the poorest independent students in higher education. In further education, we increased the bursary up to £4,500 a year and we are going to introduce a guaranteed system of uh, further education bursaries uh, and we are going to move further with the other recommendations. So Richard Leonard might describe that as nothing, but for students across the country it means more money in their pockets and I think they will welcome it warmly indeed. Richard Leonard. Well, First Minister, these are the facts. In, two, in 2013, you decimated bursary support. In 2013, bursary support in Scotland was worth £2,640 a year. You've only just put it back to £2,000 a year. That's £600 less than the level it was at before. So to recap, you promised to dump the debt, but student debt has soared. And it's those students from the most deprived backgrounds who are leaving university with the heaviest burden of debt. This government is letting down our students, but it's also letting down our universities. Universities Scotland describe, and I quote them, a pattern of cuts to core budgets. Cuts that add up to a 12% real terms decrease since 2014-15. This is a cut of £700 for every Scottish student since you became First Minister. And the fact is this, 
Government funding for our universities is decreasing at a faster rate than the Scottish Government's own budget, leading University Scotland to conclude, and I quote them again, university funding has been deprioritised. First Minister, when the budget comes to Parliament next month, will you reprioritise Scotland's universities? Will you reprioritise Scotland's students? Or will, you dump, Order. or will you dump more cuts on our universities and dump more debt on our students? First Minister. Can I remind Richard Leonard that his party brought an opposition debate to this chamber yesterday demanding that we prioritise additional money for local government in the budget. Today, less than 24 hours later, He's here in the chamber demanding that it's higher education. Can I suggest next week he comes along and tells us where he thinks all this money should be coming from? Labour have no credibility on budgets and that performance just demonstrates exactly why. But let's go back to higher education. What, we've, what Richard Leonard has managed to establish today is that we have the lowest student debt anywhere in the UK. Uh, we have rising support for students in Scotland, including students from our most deprived areas. Let me give them some other facts. Total full-time student support is up by 1.3%. Uh, Average higher education student support has increased. More full-time higher education students than ever are receiving support now. And of course, we saw the access stats out last week that show we've got record numbers uh, of Scottish domiciled, full-time, first degree entrance to university uh, at record levels. And uh, the entrance from our most deprived areas are at record levels as well. Those are the facts, Mr Leonard. That's the reality. It's under an SNP government and it's why people don't ever want Labour back in government again. Thank you. We've got some constituency supplementary questions. The first from Bob Doris, to be followed by Alec Rowley. Bob yeah. Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Bob uh, Doris. I am pr privileged to have a wonderful baby food bank in Springburn and Mr. Dorsal, just, a, just a, sh a short suspension. Parliament suspended shortly. So thank you. After that short pause, Bob Doris, can you resume with the supplementary question? Th thanks, President Officer. Well, I'm standing up to support a wonderful baby food bank in Springburn in my constituency, although I'm saddened that it's required. NHS health visitors used to refer families in need to it, but this appears to have largely stopped due to the NHS's interpretation of UNICEF guidance on breastfeeding and the use of formula milk. A local Trust will Trust food bank is now also reviewing its guidance. Can I ask the First Minister that whilst I do still await a reply from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, can the Scottish Government provide clarity to at least make sure vulnerable families know where to go to get that absolutely valuable and vital support? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, can I thank Bob Doris for his question and, of course, uh, for representing uh, the food bank that he has raised today. I mean, nobody should ever have to rely on charitable food provision in a country as rich as Scotland, especially families with young children. And that's why we're committed to eradicating child poverty and have enhanced support across the early years with the Best Start grant and the Best Starts food payment card. We're also, of course, introducing the new Scottish child payment for eligible children under six by Christmas this year. Uh, in relation to the specific point, I will ask the Health Secretary engage, to engage with the Health Board uh, so that we can uh, help uh, with interpretation of UNICEF guidance, uh, if that is possible, and also encourage a pragmatic approach regarding the provision of sustenance for infants, which is so important. Alec Rowley, to be followed by Alison Johnson. Alec Presiding officer, the Scottish Government published a low-carbon economic strategy for Scotland back in 2010, and on the subject to offshore wind, the strategy stated, and I quote, this sector alone offers the potential for 20,000 direct jobs and a further 20,000 jobs in related industries 
investment in Scotland by 2020. The jobs and opportunities are not coming to Scotland. Whilst the yards in Fife and elsewhere lie empty, the jobs are going to United Arab Emirates, Belgium, Spain, Indonesia, China, anywhere but Scotland. What is the government doing to fight for Scotland, to bring jobs to Scotland, to make sure that it is the people of Scotland who get the benefits from Scotland's natural resources? First Minister. Well, can I thank, thank Alec Rowley uh, for raising this because I, I share his frustration and the government is working extremely hard to make sure that more of the economic benefit of these projects uh, is experienced here in Scotland. It's not true to say there are no jobs coming to Scotland if we look at the NNG project where we hope there will be jacket fabrication work going to Bifab but we've also seen uh, for example INH Brown in Perth being awarded uh, work for the onshore substation uh, work. We've seen the Port of Dundee confirmed as the installation port, Eyemouth Harbour confirmed as the maintenance base. Uh, similarly with Sea Green and I uh, met with senior management uh, at SSE about Sea Green uh, last week, but we see, uh, for example, work uh, going to Montrose. The announcement they made last week about Petrofac uh, is beneficial to Aberdeen, but we want to see more fabrication and manufacturing work uh, coming to Scotland, which is why we established uh, the summit that met last week. It's also why we've announced uh, the future arrangements around the Crown Estate uh, leasing round that will uh, happen soon. Uh, developers are going to be required to set out the anticipated level and location of supply chain impact. Uh, these will be commitments that are part of the agreement process, so there will be contractual consequences if these commitments are not delivered. Uh, so that's what this government is doing within the powers we have. But I know Alec Rowley is absolutely sincere about this, so I hope he will agree with me that we must put uh, or keep putting pressure on the UK government to do more through the contract for difference process because that's where the real levers lie. Uh, I know the trade unions uh, agree with that. Uh, I certainly think that's important and I hope we get support from Alec Rowley uh, and Labour as we continue to pressure the UK government to do more within their powers as well. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Over the last week, almost 2,000 objections have been sent to Transport Scotland, objections to the proposals for a £120 million flyover at Sheriff Hall that the Scottish Government agrees will lead to even worse traffic. In the face of the climate emergency, does the First Minister agree that it's time to ditch this dated and dirty project from a bygone era and invest this sum instead in public transport Park and rides, cycling and walking, in the solutions, not the problem. First Minister. Well, obviously, objections will be considered. There is a process uh, to be gone through, and it's important that things are uh, properly considered. I've also said uh, many times in this chamber that we have to be prepared to look at all sorts of things to make sure we're meeting our climate obligations. But in terms of the Sheriff Hall uh, roundabout, of course, if we do nothing, congestion increases. Uh, in fact, will possibly increase uh, faster and make the situation worse. So we've got to make sure that we are thinking carefully about these things, but that we're taking balanced action that reduces our emissions um, and, of course, encourages active travel as well. And uh, the budget that we will bring forward, as well as the updated climate change action plan, and we'll look to do all of these things and look to do them in the proper and sensible way. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, we must remember so we can learn so those awful events are never repeated. Holocaust Memorial Day is indeed so important. Uh, the First Minister knows I have deep concerns about the mental health of many of our police officers. New research has found that 35% of police officers were turning up to work mentally unwell. In the last few weeks, four police officers have died from suicide. We don't know the reasons behind those tragedies, but police officers across the country want to know whether work contributed to their deaths. So will the First Minister order an investigation into the mental health of police officers and the support that is available to them? First Minister. Well, Willie Rennie is right to raise an important issue. Can I uh, convey my condolences to the families of police officers uh, who have died in uh, recent weeks? I think, and I hope Willie Rennie uh, will appreciate and agree with this, we don't know yet uh, all of the causes uh, and, and uh, the factors behind those deaths. It's important they are, they are all properly investigated, and I don't think it is 
either helpful or appropriate or sensitive for us to speculate too much uh, on individual cases uh, now. But the mental health of our police officers, or of everybody working in our public services, is hugely important. I have uh, spoken, uh, I think, in response to Willie Rennie in the past in the Chamber about some of the work that the police service is doing to support the well-being and mental health of police officers. Uh, police officers and staff can already access a range of services uh, to care for uh, both their physical and their mental health, uh, including through Police Scotland's Your Wellbeing Matters programme. The Scottish Government is providing uh, funding to extend the Lifeline Scotland wellbeing programme to blue light responders, including Police Scotland. Uh, Police Scotland launched uh, a wellbeing programme in 2017, which includes the introduction of wellbeing champions. Uh, that's raised awareness of the services available, such as occupational health and employee assistance, which offers counselling, and a force-wide wellbeing and engagement survey will be launched uh, soon. Uh, that will help, I hope, to identify factors that impact on the wellbeing of officers um, to then enable Police Scotland to prioritise further activities and investment. So, yes, I do agree uh, that we have to consider further action in this regard, but I think it's also important that we make police officers uh, as aware as possible of the support that is already there for them uh, within Police Scotland right now. Will there any? That is a helpful response from the First Minister. We do need to understand more about the mental well-being of our police. I would urge an investigation to look at the contracted out welfare services for police officers. Before centralisation, each police force had dedicated welfare officers who were directly responsible for looking after the well-being of a number of police. But now the service has been contracted out and Callum Steele from the Scottish Police Federation says it is a poor substitute. So will that service be part of an investigation? Yes, sir. Well, in the spirit of trying to respond helpfully on this issue, because it is such an important issue, I will take that issue away and discuss with the Justice Secretary and the Chief Constable about that in particular, and happy to come back to Willie Rennie on that. Um, obviously, there are, and, and rightly, are investigations into individual circumstances. I've already talked about some of the work that uh, the police service is doing. Um, so these matters should be and will continue to be investigated. And I, I rule nothing out, and nothing should be ruled out in terms of how we improve the uh, mental health and wellbeing support for police officers. Uh, we want there to be proper support available, given the stressful nature of the job that police officers do. And it's right that uh, not only that I... I'm able to stand here and say it's a quality service, but the police officers who rely on these services themselves feel that they are quality services. So I'm happy to give further consideration to Willie Rennie's questions uh, today, and I'm sure we'll come back to this issue further in uh, the future. Some further supplementaries. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by James Kelly. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, last month in Wuhan, China, Coronavirus, a respiratory disease, emerged which has so far killed at least six people and infected hundreds, spreading to other Asian countries and Australia. Concerns have already been expressed by virologists that due to its incubation time, when no symptoms are present, many others were already being infected. And Wuhan has international air links with some 60 cities, including London. At this time of year, of course, many more Chinese people travel due to it being Chinese New Year. Can the First Minister advise the Chamber as to what precautions have been taken and are being taken to deal with coronavirus should it reach our shores? First Minister. Well, I can assure Kenny Gibson and indeed uh, assure the Chamber that uh, together with Health Protection Scotland, we are very closely monitoring uh, what is a rapidly evolving situation. I should say that the risk to the public here in Scotland and indeed the UK is currently classified as low, but obviously that is kept under review. Health Protection Scotland are liaising with NHS boards and are currently in daily contact with Public Health England. We're also liaising daily with colleagues in the UK Department of Health. We're also paying very close attention to the decisions and the advice that comes from the World Health Organisation. Um, I can also uh, say that enhanced monitoring measures are being implemented for flights from Wuhan City to Heathrow. Uh, that will involve each flight being met by a port health team who will check for symptoms of coronavirus and provide information to all passengers and we're currently considering whether there's any further information that could helpfully be provided at Scottish airports. So uh, this is obviously uh, an evolving situation which we will monitor extremely closely um, and the Health Secretary or I will ensure that Parliament is appropriately updated uh, in the days and weeks to come. James Kelly to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention to the concerns of FDA union members 
in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Over a seven-year period, entry-level solicitors at other Scottish government departments are being paid a, a, a total £94,000 more than those working in the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. Uh, this is deeply concerning given the importance and the sensitivity of the cases that have been dealt with here. Does the First Minister agree that this pay gap is unacceptable? And will she commit to take urgent action to ensure that those who are carrying out uh, similar roles and responsibilities are paid equally? First Minister. Well, I am uh, aware of the situation. Can I uh, say at the outset that we value highly the work of uh, lawyers in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? Um, obviously, we are in a budget process right now. Uh, pay uh, discussions are uh, primarily between employees and uh, employer, in this case, uh, the Crown Office. Uh, but these are all matters that we uh, will seek to address uh, within the budget decisions uh, that we uh, take uh, to make sure uh, not only uh, that we're valuing uh, people doing these jobs, but that we uh, move to a situation as quickly as is reasonably possible, not just in this uh, area, but uh, more generally, where we have uh, pay cohesion uh, across our public services. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Stuart McMillan. The First Minister yesterday called for a well-being economy. Her Infrastructure Commission this week laid out a path to deliver it, a switch away from road building to road repair, an investment in congestion busting public transport, a rebalancing of priorities and actions. Given the urgent need to tackle the climate emergency, improve our health and keep the economy moving, will the First Minister act on this advice in the forthcoming budget? First Minister. The advice of the Infrastructure Commission will be an important part of our budget uh, consideration. Uh, we obviously established the Infrastructure Commission. I think its phase one uh, report, which was uh, published in the last few days, is a very helpful contribution uh, to how we make sure the country has uh, fit for purpose infrastructure over the next decade and beyond, but how we do that in a way that is consistent with our climate change obligations. So both in terms of our budget, in the work that we're doing right now to update the Climate Change Action Plan, uh, this uh, work and these recommendations are extremely helpful to us as we decide the best ways forward. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, Yesterday at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, uh, Edward Mountain asked whether we'd be better building CalMac vessels in South Korea as compared to Scotland. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to reiterate this government's commitment to shipbuilding in Port Glasgow? Yeah. First Minister. Um, Yes, uh, we want to ensure that shipbuilding uh, can continue in Port Glasgow. That's why we've taken the action uh, we took to secure uh, both the jobs in Ferguson's right now and the future of that yard. Uh, clearly, there is a parliamentary inquiry underway into the contracts uh, for these ferries, but we want to see these ferries built as quickly as possible and longer term. We want to see shipbuilding at Ferguson's well into the future. I'm not sure what the position of the Scottish Conservatives is, but that is very clearly the position of this Scottish Government. Question number four, Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action has been taken to address the reported problems with toxicology services at the University of Glasgow. First Minister. Forensic toxicology services are provided by Glasgow University under a contract between the University and the Crown Office. Last month, the Crown Office announced an extension until September this year of that contract. Uh, these services are essential for the independent functions of the Lord Advocate to effectively prosecute crime and investigate deaths. That announcement of the extension was accompanied by a £300,000 investment for the university to recruit additional staff, buy new equipment, address the backlog of cases awaiting analysis and secure better provision of the service until September. Uh, I very much appreciate the impact that delays in this service have upon families affected. Uh, the Lord Advocate is keeping me closely updated on the steps that the Crown Office is taking to urgently address these issues. Sandra White. I thank the First Minister for that response and, like me, as she already said, will appreciate the pain and frustration for those who are grieving and waiting on these reports to be completed. And I do appreciate these services are contracted independently by the Crown Office, but can the First Minister confirm that the Lord Advocate Office is taking steps not only for future provision of these services, but to resolve the outstanding cases as quickly as possible? First Minister. 
Uh, well, I thank Sandra White for raising what is an important issue. I understand that the Crown Office has identified another provider and is working with that provider on a stand transfer of staff and service provision. Uh, that's part of an overall programme of work for the longer term pathology, mortuary and toxicology services. Uh, in the meantime, uh, for some casework, Crown Office officials are looking at increasing capacity for those services. And in discussion with health colleagues, the Crown Office is looking at the assistance of the NHS in the short to medium term. Negative analysis amount to 40% of the outstanding cases and Crown officials are working with the university to identify what analysis is required in each remaining case and that will allow them to ascertain how best to manage that. We will of course provide whatever support we can to these efforts to ensure that these outstanding cases are resolved as quickly as is possible. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week I was contacted by constituents who lost a family member in distressing circumstances in October and have still not been told of the cause of death some three months later due to delays with the toxicology service. I'm sure the First Minister would agree this is a highly distressing situation uh, for already grieving parents. And can she give the family some assurance as to when they might get the information they're waiting for? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I, I do understand uh, how distressing this is for families. Uh, if Murdo Fraser uh, wants to provide the details of his constituent, I will ask the Crown Office to contact them directly uh, to provide what further information can be provided in that uh, individual case. Um, more generally, I've already uh, talked about the additional investment uh, to recruit staff uh, to help uh, reduce the backlog and some of the other steps that the Crown Office is taking, as well as indicating the direction of travel for the longer term of this uh, service. I'm discussing the matter regularly with the Lord Advocate. He is keeping me updated and uh, I, I want the Chamber to understand uh, how seriously um, I think uh, of this situation and how important and urgent it is that the backlog is dealt with and that the service uh, in the future uh, doesn't incur backlogs like this again. And Monica Lynn. It's First Minister, almost 2,000 families, possibly more, have been failed some waiting as long as nine months to find out why their loved one died. We've had assurances from the Lord Advocate that he would fix this. And months ago, the Justice Secretary told me to accept those assurances that it was all under control, but it's escalated into a national disgrace. Families are suffering, and vital public health information, including on drug-related deaths, is being disrupted. Families want to know why this has been a low priority and why ministers and the Lord Advocate have given false assurances. But most of all, they want to know why their loved ones have died. First Minister, isn't it time that you gave this your full attention? Because that's what it deserves. First Minister. This has uh, my full attention. This is a Crown Office uh, matter. I, uh, as I've said, have discussed this matter. Uh, I'm discussing this matter regularly with the Lord Advocate. I've set out the actions that are being taken. These are not false assurances. These are the concrete steps, including additional investment, that are being taken uh, to resolve what is a serious uh, matter. Uh, on the issue of the drug death stats, um, obviously it is important uh, that this backlog is dealt with uh, in order uh, that these uh, statistics are, are published. No decision, and I want to be very clear here, that no decision on a delay to this summer's publication uh, has been taken, and there's certainly been no indications put to ministers that publication would be delayed uh, to next year, which I saw speculated on in the media uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, this is a serious issue. It is commanding serious attention. Attention, um, and serious steps have been taken to make sure that it is resolved as quickly as possible. Question five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the rise in pollution levels on main thoroughfares in Scotland's cities. First Minister. Compared to the rest of the UK and other parts of Europe, Scotland enjoys a high level of air quality and has more stringent air quality targets than other parts of the UK, but there are still areas where air quality is below acceptable levels. The remaining pollution hotspots are in part attributable to road transport emissions in urban areas. We're therefore working to deliver low emission zones across our four biggest cities by the end of this year, with the first already introduced in Glasgow. We're also supporting local authorities in tackling local air pollution hotspots through four and a half million pounds of annual funding. An independent review of the Cleaner Air uh, Scotland strategy has identified priorities for additional action and a new strategy taking into account its findings will be published later this year. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But First Minister, it is simply unacceptable that air poll pollution levels continue to rise across Scotland, consistently breaking the legal limits and causing respiratory problems and even premature deaths. Presiding officer, 
I asked the First Minister on the 22nd of May last year if the Scottish Government were taking the damaging impact of air pollution seriously. Clearly, very little has been done as we see no progress. And the situation is worsening. The Scottish Conservatives have long called for air quality monitors to be given to schools to reassure parents that children are breathing clean air on the way to school. So for the second time, can I ask the First Minister, will she finally take affirmative action and commit to air quality monitors for all schools across Scotland for the sake of children's health? Yeah. Minister. Uh, well, we'll consider uh, all uh, positive suggestions, including uh, that one. Can I say, though, um, to uh, Rachel Hamilton, because um, I think it's important that this is, is put in context, it's a serious issue, but the number of sites exceeding the objectives is actually reducing for nitrogen dioxide uh, from 14 in 2013 to 6 in 2019 and for particulate matter from 17 in 2013 to just 1 in 2019. So that is a reduction in the number of sites, but nevertheless, uh, while there are any, that is too many. Uh, what this government is doing is firstly uh, committing to low emission zones uh, in our four largest cities. That's important. Uh, I've already talked about the review of the cleaner air strategy, and we're currently considering uh, the recommendations uh, to inform a new air quality strategy. Uh, we have already also set more stringent air quality targets than the rest of the UK and we're the first country anywhere in Europe to legislate for particulate matter 2.5, uh, which is a pollutant of special concern for human health. So this government is taking serious action. Of course, we're also proposing other things, uh, giving local authorities the power to introduce workplace uh, parking levy, to keep cars uh, out of our uh, cities and, and towns where that is possible. And perhaps if I could say this gently to the Conservatives, if they stopped their knee-jerk opposition to things like that, then perhaps they would be taken a bit more seriously on these very important issues. Question six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to figures from Oxfam Scotland, which estimate that the value of unpaid care work across the country is £36 billion. First Minister. Uh, well, our uh, carers make an immense contribution uh, to our society and that's why the government is determined to do everything we can to support Scotland's carers. It is important to note that Oxfam's 36 billion figure covers unpaid care and also a wider range of unpaid tasks such as childcare, uh, cooking and housework. Uh, but in terms of our support for carers, the Carers Act gives every carer the right to a personalised plan and support to meet eligible needs. Uh, we're fully funding the Act. We provided £17.4 to local authorities last year and an additional £10.5 million this year. Uh, this year, our package of investment in social care and integration exceeds £700 million, a 29% increase over the previous year. And of course, under our new social security powers, our carers allowance supplement gives eligible carers an extra £452.40 this year compared to carers elsewhere in the rest of the UK. But I would uh, want to take this opportunity to thank uh, unpaid carers uh, for the work they do each and every day. Mark Griffin. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The, the, the work backed by One Parent Family Scotland, Carer Scotland and the Health and Social Care Alliance highlights those living in or at risk of poverty tend to spend more hours caring, while Oxfam's polling also finds 7 in 10 Scots support increased social security benefits for carers. The First Minister will know that when the Department for Work and Pensions increases the carers' allowance earnings threshold, by just £5 in April. It won't keep pace with the national living wage. It risks carers yeah. uh, losing the benefit if they go up one penny over it, forces them to negotiate with employers to potentially reduce their hours or stop working altogether. Does the First Minister agree that the carers' allowance earnings threshold cliff edge is a disincentive to work and should be urgently reformed? First Minister. Well, I, I certainly agree that the DWP does not provide adequate support uh, to carers and I would like to see uh, that support increased and extended and I, I think Mark Griffin makes uh, a legitimate point. But that's exactly why uh, we are using uh, our powers here in Scotland to increase the support that carers uh, are entitled to. Uh, as I said in my original answer, the carers allowance supplement gives an extra uh, just more than £450 a year to carers. Uh, that's... Uh, 
an increase in carers' allowance of around 13%. Uh, we're also, of course, introducing the Young Carers Grant, which will be an annual £300 payment. Uh, so it's not just about financial support, it's about support in other ways as well. Uh, but it's vital that we continue to do that. And I hope collectively as a parliament, we will also continue to uh, urge the UK government to give better support as well. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Beatrice Wishart on the proposed centralisation of air traffic control in the Highlands and Islands. But we'll just have a short suspension before then to allow members, ministers and the gallery to change seats. A short suspension. Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland, I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama. You know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can OK it, unless it goes through London. Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish. Um, what's happening today? Hello, and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. There is now and forever will be known as the rape cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe in 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was balanced on. And I think we made it by 53%, if I remember correctly, for going in. And ever since that time, England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European. And that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. About the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets. Mm -hmm. 